what do we actually mean by trap fall? What is a trap fall? Obviously, this is a metaphor. And it seems to me that this is fairly close to Bibo's, I'm going to call it cul-de-sac, the Americans call it dead end, the Jacques Utsa. Um, in other studies, I think in both philosophy and literary theory, it's called aporia. It's not too far from Zugzwang. It's a situation where one actor has much weaker agency than the other actor, if we're talking in, in binary opposition, which is probably no bad thing to do. And what I want to do uh, in, uh, well, I better have a quick look at the time before I exceed it. Uh, what I want to do in, in brief is to put forward an argument to suggest that the relationship between Central Europe and Western Europe is one of trapfall, in which the stronger and the weaker party are unable to come to uh, some kind of a, an even, uh, evening out of power. Um, and that has a long-term historical, a long durée perspective, but I think is present today. And these are the, the elements that I want to look at. And obviously, I am informed by the 13 years that I've spent as a Hungarian member of the European Parliament. Now, this is where I look at my notes. Um, I think my starting point is the asymmetry of power. There's always been a symmetry of power. Uh, inevitably, in a particular Kukazel. So I'm, I'm just left with my voice now, am I? <laughs> okay. Uh, you can still hear me. me, me, me okay, Rembem. Um, so basically, Europe is a particular area which has always been subject to asymmetries of power. And these asymmetries of power in the past uh, have been settled by violence or war. Um, and it seems to me that one of the greatest achievements of Europe, post-1945, is to find ways of dealing with the asymmetries of power through conflict resolution, not involving violence. Now, if we go back to 1945, I'm just old enough to remember this, uh, what we have is a totally traumatized Europe. Both sides of what eventually became the Iron Curtain, Fulton speech. Um, how does one escape the trauma? Now here, um, I'm relying on the work of uh, Piotr Stompka and Jeffrey Alexander who write about uh, social trauma, the impact of events beyond the control uh, of the agent. And it seems to me, and I'm contracting the argument is that what the West managed quite successfully to do is to create uh, escapes from trauma. And I think the European integration process is fundamentally about this. It worked very well. If you want to uh, contract it even further, then you can say, what is European integration about? It's to ensure that there's never going to be another war between France and Germany. Brilliant success. There hasn't been another war between France and Germany. Great. Um, and this, I want to signal at this point that the significance of conflict resolution, I think, is the most important part of European integration. Many people do not agree with me. But as far as I'm concerned, uh, this is where it all begins. Now, if we look at this part of the world, which I'm going to call Central Europe, uh, we can argue with Elamir's spirit on this particular proposition. We, what Central Europe, I would suggest, I would put to you, has is a very long durée experience, going back centuries, of repeated attempts at exogamous transformation, which more than ever, more often than not, takes the form of an imperium, an imperial rule, which attempts to enforce its own particular modalities, its own particular order, on societies which have different perspectives, different aspirations. Um, I've written about this and indeed, oh yes, I have actually submitted a text. I think I'm the first to do this, but the text is available and I go into this in, in great detail. The outcome of these attempts of exogamous transformation, and I think 
probably the Lucas Classicus is Joseph II's uh, absolutism, which generates a resistance, and it's this resistance to the, the transformative attempts which I think characterize the region, and the fact that the attempts to achieve the transformation uh, are never fully successful, which means that there are incomplete, um, indeterminate outcomes, which I think is part of this region's history, which then necessarily means that agency is weak, uh, or the sense of agency, the sense of achievement uh, in this region um, continuously lags behind what Western Europe uh, has or what it thinks it has. These are very much subjective perceptions. Um, about 10 years ago, a volume of work by Bobich Mihai was published with the title Lead Ellen Alash, Be Resistance. You can also translate it as the resistance of flies, but that's just the vagaries of the English or the Hungarian language. Um, now, to my mind, this is quite extraordinary. I do not think that it would be possible to publish a volume of poetry, let's say, by Ted Hughes and call it Be Resistance. Uh, I can't even think of T.S. Eliot, Be Resistance, forget it. Yet this, it seems to me, is, and I'm not even sure that this is all, all that central to Bobbage's work, Resistance, but be that as it may, I use this simply to illustrate the continuous strength of the proposition that power should be resisted and that power is sort of suspect, but certainly if it's exogamous power, it's doubly suspect. So that brings me, as I say, this is a contracted version of what I have to say, uh, to 1989, and which I guess most of us have actually lived through. Um, it seems to me that that's when we begin, or re-begin, relaunch the region's encounter with the West, from which obviously this region was cut off from 1945-47, take your pick. Um, I do not think that this encounter has been particularly successful for all sorts of reasons, and I will go through some of these. Um, basically, and I, I know I'm, I'm simplifying, but I think that in the last 13 years of membership of the European Union, but to some extent even before that, what this region has undergone is yet another re-engineering project. The attempt to transform these states into something which is like something else. In other words, the expectations of whether it's Berlin or Paris or London or uh, Amsterdam or in a way it doesn't really matter. And above all, Brussels, the symbolic Brussels with which we're all familiar and should be stopped, of course. As you know the reference I'm making. So the consequence of this, it seems to me, is that we're living in a world of new and old, old new trap falls. And I've made a list here. Uh, some of these obviously dovetailed with what we heard earlier. Um, the way in which the two parts of Europe have not become one, they continuously suffer from flawed perceptions. The first one I've put down is the false expectations. If we go back 20 odd years, it seems to me there were expectations in this part of the world that we would catch up, we being Central Europe. Now, if you look at the figures, there has been considerable growth in each and every one of the 11 countries that have since joined the European Union, weakest in Romania and Bulgaria. But, you know, compare us with the way we were 15 years ago. So GDP per capita has grown, but not one country of this region has managed to overtake any of the EU 15. 2004 figures, I have to check exactly. Um, Slovenia and the Czech Republic were ahead of Greece and Portugal. Greece, of course, is in a totally disastrous state, so maybe some of the other countries have overtaken Greece. Nothing else. So that the discontinuity of growth has actually meant no catching up. It's an expectation that has not been met. I would say also, second point, mutual incomprehension. Um, a, an anecdote, which anecdotes sometimes do help to illustrate. When I en arrived in Parliament in 2004, some of us took a decision that we would try to set up a working group to work on the unification 
of Europe's history. So about half a dozen of us sat down, and by strange coincidence, each and every one of us was from a former communist country. Uh, Poles and Balts, and I think there was one in Romania, and I can't remember. Nobody from the EU 15 ever came. Um, dismal failure. You simply can't get the message through. There's lack of interest. Let me say it's mutual. I mean, what do we know about the history of Portugal? Not a lot. About the history of Ireland or history of Sweden and Norway. So we don't know much about them, but they, I think, know even less. But maybe that's difficult to measure. So this ignorance on the part of the EU 15 is significant precisely because of the asymmetry of power. That there's much greater power, economic power, political power, status power, power in whichever area we want to look at it. Um, and very difficult to bridge that gap in consequence. I'm also very conscious of narratives about Central Europe, which are great gross oversimplifications of the sociological political realities. There are good guys and bad guys. Um, and those are stereotyped. We're not supposed to stereotype countries, but actually we do. Just look at the Western media. The Czechs are generally good guys. I think the Estonians are quite good guys. I'm not so sure that we are, but or the Poles, anyway. Uh, the Romanians, likewise. Uh, the Lithuanians have been in the bad boy corner or two at various different times. Ötpert? What do you admire, Ötpert? Uh, I'm coming to an end. Um, there is this general sense, which I encounter quite frequently, the sense, well, why can't the Central Europeans be like us? Now, the fascinating dimension of this is that, of course, Western Europe, European um, democracy is about diversity. But there are certain kinds of diversity that are somehow undesirable, and as it happens, ours is one of these. I mean, I have put it that... Our problem is that, is that we're different without being exotic. You know, if you're exotic, you can be forgiven a great deal, but we're not exotic. We're sort of too like them, so maybe in Jungian terms, we are the shadow, we are the bad brother, the dark brother, but I don't want to take that argument too far. I would say a further problem here is the unreliable translators. What is it that gets through to the West? And who is it who's doing the translation? I'm not making a, a political point. I'm making much more a sociological and cultural point. I, my next point is simply two words, Larry Wolf. Now, I don't know how many of you know his book. Uh, he basically says that ever since the 18th century, the French Enlightenment, Voltaire, Diderot, and the others, constructed a Central Europe or an Eastern Europe that was its dark other. In other words, we are civilized, Paris, clearly, but if you want to contrast it civilized against what? Against what? Well, it's the hairy barbarians to the east. How far to the east? Oh, just, as, just as far as you like. And I believe that this particular uh, narrative is still there. Um, a particular problem of which I'm acutely conscious is that if we go back to the post-45 integration project, the, cent the central element of which, in my view, uh, is conflict resolution, this is increasingly overtaken, and indeed to some extent marginalized, by the discourse of human rights. Human rights are infinite, and it's a moral statement. How can you create compromises when you have a discourse which says, no, 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 human rights are more significant than anything else. And that particular conflict between conflict resolution and human rights, I think, is a living problem uh, in, the, uh, in the relationship between what I'm calling the EU 15 and the EU 11. So basically, we're back to the asymmetries of power. And I think my pessimism, and I am pessimistic, uh, is that we've not been able to find the mutual language. We've not really been able to find the, the shared ideas on the basis of which we get the same status that we think we should have in the eyes of the EU15, the West, whatever you want to call it. Thank you very much. I think I've taken up that time. Fairy gave me a, what I didn't know at the time, 
a difficult and then I proved to be almost impossible task. I'm supposed to explain to you um, Elmer's thoughts on democracy. He and I, I think Elmer is probably the third live Hungarian I ever met, right? And we have talked about politics on a few occasions, uh, but either I can't remember or it was not sufficiently deeply implanted theoretically that I don't know some of that. So the first thing I did when I agreed, perhaps unfortunately, to accept this invitation was to take the three books of Elmer that I happened to have in my private library out in the countryside, <clears throat> and I looked in the index. Not a word about democracy. Then I looked under elections, nothing. Political parties, nothing. Authority, nothing. Power had one citation, but it had nothing to do with democracy, okay? So there I was. So then I sent an emergency message back to Ferdy and said, please send me something that, you know. He did send me, or he had one of his assistants send me, and there wasn't much in that either. So I decided to plunge into what I had at hand, and then I found it. Brilliantly, I found it. On page 183 of his book on fear and anxiety, something which I think is very important, and it is a dialectical observation. He distinguishes on that page between two forms of rationality, and he insists that both are rational. This is the, the genius, it seems to me, in this. Namely, what he calls Promethean, which is basically the rationality we think of all the time, that is to say, a rationality based on material advantage and marginal uh, advantage, marginal choice, etc. And the other rationality, which he calls Apollonian, uh, which is based on sentiments, values, symbols, rather than things and material payoffs. And he insists that both are rational. Now, what the implication of this for democracy, especially for what I tend to call not really democracy, but real existing democracy, that is approximately as close to democracy as socialism was to, or real existing socialism was to socialism, the implication is very clear. A stable, viable, legitimate, real existing democracy, liberal, representative, capitalist, uh, I don't know, constitutional, has to deal with both forms of rationality. It cannot be just simply, quote, materially rational. It must also be symbolically, spiritually rational. And that's the problem. We have gotten used to, especially, I must say, academics, unfortunately, uh, this very exceptional period of the famous, the French call it les temps glorieux, the 30 years after World War, the end of World War II, where liberal democracy in Western Europe sort of implanted itself, reproduced itself, and didn't seem to be creating terribly serious problems. And we get the apotheosis of this from dear old Francis Fukuyama, who's declared the end of history, in which we're supposed to have arrived at liberal democracy and no more political problems will exist because liberal democracy is the neck plus ultra of legitimate political forms. There. Now, Francis was right. We did end, or we did arrive at an end of a period of history. What he forgot to tell us was that the next period was going to be much worse and more tumultuous and difficult for liberal democracy rather than its triumph. It was its, in a sense, new crisis. And this, I see, element exists. I mean, there's a very clear uh, expression in his work of, the, of crisis. And he has also, Elmer, I was a little bit surprised because in our conversations, he, I didn't hear this, but then I read it. And Elmer was an optimist. I didn't think so. I mean, from some of our conversations, I think we both lamented a lot of things. But anyway, he turns out to believe, as many do, that uh, 
crisis is opportunity. We all know the famous, you know, the Chinese character for crisis is the same character as for opportunity. That's a, okay. So he seems to and concluded in some of his work that, yes, we're in crisis, but the crisis is an opportunity to produce somehow a better. Now, here's where the problem begins. Because for Elamir, the unit of analysis is not the political regime. It's civilization. Now, I come from a discipline which doesn't even like to use the word civilization. I don't trust the word civilization. When people say Western civilization, I think they're trying to hide something, right? So I don't. <laughs> so civilization for me has never been a unit of analysis, too much variation within these categories. And, and this famous clash of civilizations of <laughs> you know who, anyway, is again one of those self fulfilling prophecies, perhaps. Anyway, this distinction between two forms of rationality, clearly what has happened is that we have become less and less Promethean and more and more Apollonian. Right? So all of a sudden, the Apollonian side of political authority, namely the importance of values and the importance of symbols and identification especially, is increasingly important. Okay, so And we're not prepared for it. Because this famous 30 years, we've had such an unusually tranquil kind of stable democracy in Western Europe and North America, let's say, but even a few other places, that we forgot this other side of rationality. We forgot the necessity that democracy must produce people with, whoop, with some kind of viable sense of being, of identity, of fulfillment, or, or whatever it is. And we just assumed that if you produced enough material goods, and well, that would be sufficient to keep it going. Now, I was prepared for this, because in my work, right from the beginning, I've been something of a slavish follower of Albert Hirschman. I don't know how many of you are familiar with a brilliant book by Albert called The Passions and Interests. That's exactly what I, I never asked Elmer about Albert, but I don't know if they knew each other or read each other or whatever, but in any case, that book is about the way in which the concept of the pursuit of self-interest without regard for anybody else became, so to speak, the dominant theme, certainly of economics, but also infiltrated the literature on politics, right? And that that was supposed to be the end of history. You just had to need a bunch of self-serving people whose material interest would be clearly to perpetuate this class-based uh, democracy and everything would be fine. Okay. But Albert then reminds people that they're still passions, right? And so what we're looking at now is a new form of expression of passionate intensities, or concerns with specific kinds of problems that cannot be resolved simply by distributing material goods to people. You have to distribute some sense of meaning to their collective existence. And there we have Donald Trump. Now, I admit in the case of Trump, there may be a strong element of sheer irrationality because of some rather peculiar personality characteristics, but not all of these populist politicians are as bizarre and erratic as he is. Some of them are perfectly rational human beings, and, but they're following and they're responding to a different form of demand, a kind of the other side of this dialectic of passions and interests, or Apollonians and, 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 uh, and Prometheans. Now, I had some ideas in here about how you might resolve that. One minute, OK. Historically, the instrument for resolving this conflict has been political parties. Political parties both protected, promoted the material interest of particular followers, usually along class lines on that famous left-right uh, continuum, but it also provided people with an identity and some kind of ideology or program that implied future, not perfection, at least improvement. Right? Political parties, they haven't disappeared. They can't disappear because you need them for elections. But in people's minds, political parties have literally evaporated. My favorite example, because I live in Italy, 
at one point in survey research, um, it was revealed that with the possible exception of the Greeks, the Italians had the highest level of party identification of any Western democracy. 85% of young Italians knew the political affiliation of their parents. Now, that didn't mean they necessarily followed, but they knew it. They were, you know, the family talked about politics, and you knew whether your family was communist or socialist or liberal or Christian Democrat. Today, that's less than 25%. Now, that's dramatic. That suggests that the normal mechanism that political parties used historically to pass on from one generation to another a kind of has literally disappeared. People don't have that kind of memory anymore. And as I say, in the European country, which had the highest level of it, so to speak, obviously the greatest fall. So the question becomes twofold. One, can we revive political parties? Is there a formula, a possible set of reforms that could make political parties meaningful to people again? Or two, can we replace political parties? Can we invent some new forms of representation? And here there's a certain amount of noise on the changing technology of politics which suggests that maybe you can use electronic means of communication to produce or to nominate candidates and to conduct elections without political parties. So I leave you with that. But the important thing is I found this brilliant because this was, ex I think it's exactly the kind of distinction we need to be thinking about in order to face this really major crisis in the nature of Western democracy. Okay. Thank you. Just to start, um, over the past 30 years of coming to Hungary, um, I met Elamir on many, many occasions, both in Budapest and here in Kuseg. Not only was I struck by his erudition, but I also recognized that it was combined with a gentle but profound insightfulness that always brought Samuel Beckett and Zen Buddhism to mind. Um, in many ways, when, when Elamir made presentations, there were so many questions that I couldn't help but think about, you know, a, a koan, a Zen koan, in which, you know, what, what is the sound of one hand clapping, right? You know, these kinds of questions that were meant to stimulate the mind and to get you out of your normal way of thinking. Um, but he also shared some sensibility with, with Samuel Beckett, it seems to me. Um, Beckett uh, was written to by a young Irish writer shortly after a fellow named Aidan Higgins, shortly after uh, Waiting for Godot was produced in, um, in Paris in the late 1950s. And Higgins wrote him by way of you know, asking for some counsel. He was a young writer, and he wanted to know what Beckett thought. Everybody said, Beckett won't write you back. But Beckett did write him back. Four words by way of counsel. Those four words were, despair young and never look back, right? It's exactly that kind of mix of pessimism and optimism. And in some ways, um, you would think that actually Beckett gave the same kind of advice to Elamir, um, despair young. And Beckett, if you, if you stop and look at what happened in Elamir's life, he had a very happy childhood. He, he writes about this, very happy childhood. And then World War II came. Um, the despair arrived. He was 16 years old. He, he said, our entire family was dragged into the depths. And from that moment on, I considered the world an alien world. He would admit even in 2013 that he still felt this way. Quote, not only personally, but I believe the whole of mankind lives in a very cold, alienated world in which it is very hard to live as a human being. One result was he was always interested in the great questions of human existence. Um, in spite of this despair, and again here, I think Beckett is 
relevant. Um, in the final novel of his trilogy, the novel is called The Unnameable, for those of you who don't know it. The last few lines of the character go like this. It will be I. You must go on. I can't go on. You must go on. I'll go on. You must say words as long as there are any. Elamir did go on, and he also said words despite their increasing disappearance in slogans and advertising. This was because, as he said, quote, it is obvious that we need to fight for everything, and especially against human suffering. As many people here will know, I think, Elamir himself suffered significantly in the middle years of his life. I have little doubt that he often said the equivalent of, I'll go on. Um, he thought of himself after World War II as an, and again, to quote from him, an outsider, and found that to be considered as such was a big shock. But then, with the communist era, he was, quote, considerably, completely excluded as a class enemy. As I think everybody knows, he went to prison in the 1950s. And he said, prison was good, both personally and professionally. It was a useful challenge to see if you are able to hang on, to go on. When they took me in, he said, early in the morning I was shaking with fear. I was wondering what was about to happen. The rumors were terrifying. Although we were hiding, they caught us. They didn't beat us. It was just the psychological torture that went on for three or four months. It was not only you being tortured. It was watching how your cellmates were treated. That was terrible. Sometimes their fear of death was worse than your own. They were facing horrible sentences. The prison was good for seeing what you are able to bear. I mean to, I mean to see if you were able to act like you write, like a man should act. I can't claim that. If I had been physically tortured, I would have been able to keep it together. But I can tell you one thing. I was able to bear a wide range of psychological torture. It is useful to try it, to challenge yourself that you are not that you are able not just to speak, but to stand up for your thoughts. Finally, in this regard, uh, and you know, I, I tentatively titled this presentation The Existential Crisis of the Self because it's something I've been concerned about for a long time. You know, the fact that the old narratives don't work very well anymore, and that there's a real crisis of meaning underlying contemporary existence. Uh, in a conference chaired by Timothy Gart Nash in the late 90s, he made similar arguments about the, quote, new consumer civilization because, in his words, it was unable to offer answers to the essential questions of human life. In the absence of such answers, a trivial consumer culture, he said, meaning advertising, offers surrogate, shallow alternatives, which, according to Elamir, people will, quote, buy as long as no others are offered by churches, the state, or other institutions. The most compelling commentary that he made about our existential crisis was an essay that he wrote um, shortly after the attacks of September 11th in the United States. He was asked to contribute an essay by the Social Science Research Council in New York. And I want to quote from one, one portion of that because I think it's profound, but I also think that in some ways um, it's a bit incorrect. Um, it starts out with emphasis, death, triumphant. With a certain degree of exaggeration, th these are Elamir's words, with a certain degree of exaggeration, one could say that together with the towers, the buildings, the illusion of immortality collapsed as well on September 11th. We, people living in our contemporary consumer civilization, believe and want to believe so strongly in the power of the human being to solve the problems of life that we have almost come to believe that even the ultimate problem of human existence, mortality, can be solved. Or at least it can and should be eliminated from human consciousness. And again, his words, and on September 11th, we were suddenly and rudely confronted with the fragility of human life. 
and we could not avert our eyes from the terrible sight. We could not ignore anymore the unacceptable fact of death. Even if only temporarily, death has moved into our hearts. Several scholars um, have argued that the denial of death is one of the, most, is one of the main characteristics of citizens of contemporary Western civilization, the civilization of consumption. As many of you know, Elamir was profoundly influenced by Ernest Becker, who wrote a book by that title, The Denial of Death. Um, and Becker argued that much more was at stake in the ordeal of mankind than shelter and safety. The goal was to achieve immortality, or at least to conquer the fear of death. Becker argued that the fear of death is the main motive force in human life. The idea of death, the fear of it, haunts the human animal like nothing else. It is a mainspring of human activity, activity designed largely to avoid the fatality of death, to overcome it by denying in some way that it is the final destiny of man. In contrast, Hankish noted that Becker emphasized the primary importance of society and civilization. He argued, the main function and raison d'etre of society is nothing else than to provide its members with meaningful roles that help them ignore the emptiness of being and the futility of their lives. But Hankish was wrong in pointing to September 11th. I think he'd become a bit of a New Yorker. In reality, it was in August 1945, with the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that we were suddenly and rudely confronted with the fragility of human life, and that death moved into our hearts. In this sense, the existential crisis is concrete, not abstract or spiritual. Um, some years ago, when I was at an Institute in California, we had a meeting with William Perry. Some of you may have seen his recent book. Um, Perry was number three at the Pentagon in the Carter administration in the late 1970s. He was the technical expert, right? He was the engineer. He got a call in the middle of the night from the general under Cheyenne Mountain in Colorado which is where the command center is for nuclear weapons. He looked, um, the, the general said to him, Mr. Perry, I'm sorry to disturb you, but I'm calling you instead of the president because I think there's a technical problem um, and our computer screens shouldn't be showing several hundred Soviet missiles coming in on the United States. They solved the problem. It was somebody had put a t training tape into the computers. Now imagine, imagine that there was a different general under Cheyenne Mountain today, and that that general called Donald Trump. If you don't have an existential crisis over that, you should have. The same thing happened, of course, on the Soviet side. Right. Stanislav Petrov, the man who saved the world on the, during the Reagan administration, faced the same kind of problem. And he decided that the geopolitical situation did not merit showing NATO missiles coming in on the Soviet Union. He took a risk. The submarine in this photo, the USS Kentucky, is part of a class of submarines, seven to ten of which are out and see right now. Right? Um, it's ready for a message from the President of the United States, should it be needed. It has 200 nuclear weapons on it. Each one has a destructive power 30 times that of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Uh, in addition to the bombs on the Kentucky and other submarines like it, the United States has another 3,000 nuclear weapons on ready alert, as do the Russians. This means, essentially, I mean, 
I wouldn't worry about it. I'm expecting to have a drink tonight. Um, this means we'd all be dead in an hour, essentially. Right? The decision-making time that the President of the United States has is a little over five minutes. Just, what's that? I want to end this discussion by um, uh, reading something to you from uh, Jonathan Schell's book, The Fate of the Earth, which transformed many people's minds about what was going on with nuclear weapons. Here's Schell. Only life itself, which nuclear weapons threaten to swallow up, can give the measure of their significance. Yet in spite of the immeasur immeasurable importance of nuclear weapons, the world has declined, and this is about us, the world has declined on the whole to think about them very much. We have thus far failed to fashion or to discover within ourselves an emotional or intellectual or political response to them. The, this peculiar failure of response in which hundreds of millions of people acknowledge the presence of an immediate unremitting threat to their existence and to the existence of the world they live in but do nothing about it a failure in which both self-interest and fellow feelings seem to have died, has itself been such a striking phenomenon that it has to be regarded as extremely important. And finally, the Hiroshima people's experience, accordingly, is of much more than historical interest. It is a picture of what our whole world is always poised to become, a backdrop of scarcely imaginable horror lying just below the surface of our normal life and capable of breaking through into that normal life at any second. Whether we choose to think about it or not, it is an omnipresent, inescapable truth about our lives today that, every, that at every single moment, each one of us may suddenly become the deranged mother looking for her, and this is the experience Shell is talking about from Hiroshima. The deranged mother looking for her burned child the professor with a ball of rice in his hand whose wife has just died in the fires. Mr. Fukai running back into the firestorm. The naked man standing on the blasted plain that was his city, holding his eyeball in his hand, or more likely, one of millions of corpses. For whatever our modest hopes as human beings may be, every one of them can be nullified by a nuclear holocaust. So there's a moral challenge to all of us. I would challenge all of you, you know, if you can bear it, read about the victims of Hiroshima. Put it in your mind. It's not easy, but do it. For our own survival, the survival of our children, grandchildren, and friends and lovers. And let us continue Elamir's work and confront the fragility of human life and move death from our hearts and replace it with that which makes us human politics informed by love. Thanks very much. Elmer Henke's theory of civilization is indeed provoking and brave endeavor to explore the domain usually neglected by conventional sociology. In general, mo modern social sciences are expected to follow certain procedures of research, like collecting empirical evidence, discovering cause-effect relations, making their predictions, etc. A formal scientific method tends to compartmentalize human experience into specific categories, like strictly biological or mechanical ones, preferably measurable by quantitative indices. According to mainstream thinking, every more general attempt to understand human existence must be qualified as metaphysical or even speculative, which is not quite true. I am very interested in the problem of rationality and objectivity within social sciences. And the problem really exists, as in case of efforts to justify hierarchies within contemporary society and to introduce the concept of homo hierarchicus by Francis Fukuyama. My philosophical and social study on this topic was quite revealing for me. I presume that rationality, despite highly intellectual vocabulary, can be disclosed as biased ideological assumption. According to Elmer Henke's theory of civilization, 
existential insecurity of human beings has induced them to create protective spheres of symbols, which are myths, religions, values, belief systems, theories, etc. Rationality is one of the key factors contributing to the construction of civilization in technical and symbolic terms. As Henkish has emphasized, protective spheres of symbols may collapse, thus causing a profound social crisis. For example, there were tremendous social and political transformations at the end of the 20th century. As a result, management theories have been revised to deal with transition and uncertainty. Francis Fukuyama has reacted to the dispute by the book The Great, by the, book, the Great Disruption. His approach has been supportive of hierarchical organization as the best solution when facing a disruption. Due to the lack of time, I will focus on a couple of Fukuyama's arguments, historical and biological, just to trace their inconsistencies. Fukuyama's approach is some sort of response to the rising civil society and new ideas regarding a reconfiguration of organizational framework to replace hierarchical structures by spontaneous networks having higher degree of freedom. He appeals for the rational normative values which supposedly are in favor of existing hierarchies. But the definition of rational norms indicates what is wrong with rationality itself. Allegedly, these norms are chosen after rational choice and rational discussion. The only discrepancy in this definition is namely who sets the terms of discussion? Fukuyama has referred to so-called neutral and historically proven authority, Protestantism, thus frequently quoting Max Weber. Fukuyama's chosen examples of failed societies mainly point to non-Protestant regions as Latin America or Southern Italy. So Homo hierarchus is a very interesting entity which manages to purify all irrational drives in its way to higher efficiency. Fukuyama is not convincing in this regard because there are many authors like Richard Tony or Fernand Brodel who indicated more complex patterns of capitalist society's development. Richard Tony has made very relevant remark in his book Religion and the Rise of Capitalism. In every human soul there is a socialist and an individualist, an authoritarian and a fanatic for liberty and in each there is a Catholic and a Protestant. It seems that Fukuyama's rational values are rather affirmative than normative. Another biological Fukuyama's argument for hierarchy is worth quoting. It's a long quotation, but it's quite interesting. The beginning of quote. There is a final reason why hierarchy is not about to disappear from modern organization anytime soon. Human beings by nature like to organize themselves hierarchically. Or to put it more precisely, those on the top of hierarchies find the satisfaction that recognition of their social status brings so enjoyable. That it frequently outweighs money and material wealth as a source of happiness. Those on the bottom of hierarchies like it, like it much less. But we usually have no choice. In any case, there are enough hierarchies scattered about in modern societies that most people can end up in the middle to upper range of at least one of them. Either way, what people dislike most, most is not hierarchy in principle, but hierarchies in which they end up in the bottom. End of quote. So if you want to be happy, just fit the right hierarchy. Fukuyama has invoked, here two, has invoked here two biological chemical claims. Firstly, the feeling of happiness depends on the level of serotonin within brains. And the second, the dominance in hierarchy increases the level of serotonin in the brain of chimpanzee males in their fights for alpha male status, according to some biological researchers. Why chimpanzees? Naturally, they frequently confess before human beings for explanatory purpose. The cause effect reasoning can hide certain flaws of subjective and manipulative character, what is supposed to draw a close attention to the issue of hierarchical happiness 
or in other words, the myth of serotonin. Serotonin as a chemical compound within human brains is widely expected to be a physical substance of happiness or good psychological well-being. The shortage of serotonin and depression is the causal link admitted in psychiatric practice. Antidepressant pharmaceuticals are supposed to increase the level of serotonin and to cure depression. But there is a troubling statistic. According to the U.S. National Health and Nutritional Nutrition Examination Service, antidepressants were the third most common prescription drug taken by Americans of all ages and, and the most frequently used by persons aged 18 44. There is indicated nearly 400% increase of antidepressant use in the United States among all ages. So we may conclude that the problem of happiness is, mo is quite a complex one and includes more than hierarchical fitness. The progress itself and the presence of abundant hierarchies did not diminish human anxiety and fear. Follow following Elmer Henkish, much that allegedly is improved only may be a more sophisticated technique to repress disturbing human experiences. A, a hierarchy being available as such nevertheless is not a natural or social necessity. Homo hierarchicus, like its cousin Homo economicus, is just another symbolic bubble imposing certain dominant values. This may sound trivial, but as pointed out by Elmer Henkisch, trivialities are sometimes not trivial at all. Thank you. I also wanted to give a little space between um, Professor Schmitter's talk and mine, because when I use the term dialectics, we're going to be going over again some of the same territory, but maybe in a little bit different way. Um, when I talk about dialectical thinking, I'm referring to the concept that, that Philippe already mentioned, that two opposing ideas can both exist at the same time, and they can both be true. Um, the universe is filled with opposing sides and opposing forces. Um, in a Hegelian sense, everything is composed of contradictions. And there is a movement from idea or thesis to antithesis to thin synthesis. And that enables us to become closer to the truth in our search for the truth. Um, because I started out as a Scandinavianist, I have to bring up Kierkegaard. So um, in Kierkegaardian dialectics, there is the manifestation of man's separation and alienation from himself or herself and society, and also the expression of the human struggle towards integration and liberation. In fact, this is one peculiar, peculiarity of Kierkegaard that I thought was important in today's discussion. Um, he was extremely sensitive to the fluidity of meanings of most terms in everyday speech. And he rejected the tendency of academics to artificially fix meanings. So I believe that dialectics comprise a critical essence of Elmer Honkish's thinking. Um, for as all of us who were his students and were present at his very colorful presentations, they were most often constructed in a dialectical fashion. He posed one characteristic of identity formation or of the history of civilization, and then he, proved, he provided a counterexample. And it was always up to us, his students, his audience, to think about and construct some kind of synthesis from his presentations of a wide variety of topics. Physics, cosmology, philosophy, theology, cult cultural anthropology, psychology, history of ideas, the arts, and that's just the beginning of the list of what he showed us. Um, in the book, The Toothpaste of Immortality, and I have a little anecdote that goes with that, um, Elamir would call me up 
at the strangest times of day or night or when I was in the strangest places to ask me about a better translation for a word. And I remember exactly this title. I was at a massage. And the phone rings and I saw it was Ella Mare and I said, well, you have to excuse me. I really think I must answer this. And because we also shared some physical problems together that we would discuss sometimes. And, um, and he goes, Jody, you know, what do you think of that title, The Toothpaste of Immortality? And I go, I'm, I'm not really convinced, Ella Mare. You know, I, I'm not quite sure where you're going with this. And he goes, well, can you give me some alternatives? I go, can you tell me what you mean? I don't, didn't really understand what the concepts of the toothpaste of immortality meant. Um, but he was right. Um, it is a good title. And it, uh, you know, it makes you curious. So you go in and you try to find out what it is. Anyway. Um, to get back to my text. In The Toothpaste of Immortality, he argues the middle road between those like Max Weber, who believe that we have a strong inner core, and those who say that we have many selves, or no selves, only roles. In his own synthesis, Elmer says we have a kind of inner core from which we gain direction in our lives, and we also have a lot of roles and many selves. And there is a dynamic between that core self and the peripheral self of everyday relations. My next slide. I enjoyed so much finding these graphics because that's one of the things Elamere was fantastic at, was finding some pictures to go with his text. And so I had a lot of fun thinking the way I remembered he may be thinking to find the most kind of dramatic images for you. Um, Elamere describes the dialectic world that we live in um, as a so-called information age where only facts, numbers, digital codes are important as rational messages and as a society of experience. A re-enchanted society where myths, emotions, and mythologies are important. And he thinks that we are re-enchanting ourselves now more than ever before. In Fears and Symbols, he writes about two strategies humankind uses to conquer existential fears. And the first is the Promethean strategy that was mentioned by Professor Schmitter. That goes back to the Prometheus myth that was already mentioned this morning, the mythical hero who brought fire to humankind and then was severely punished for that action. Um, he, Pro, uh, Elamere saw Prometheus as a metaphor for meeting our material, external um, needs for survival, fire, warmth, security, food, and shelter. And so the Promethean strategy refers to everything people do to feel externally and materially secure in a universe in which many things, like natural catastrophes, are unpredictable and can threaten human existence. So we build houses, we invent technology that is supposed to make our lives easier and smoother. But this isn't enough, if you're a human being, just to have your physical needs alleviated. Um, people have spiritual needs, spiritual fears of death, for example, which also need to be taken care of. And this is where the Apollonian strategy comes in. We have questions about why am I here? What is the meaning of life? So the Apollonian strategy attempts to conquer the fear of death that destroys human efforts and makes them seem in vain. In order to overcome this fear, people began to tell stories that lifted their own existence up into a higher plane and gave life meaning. These stories became grand narratives that are not questioned for their original human construction. And I'm talking about the grand narratives of Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, Judaism. So why does Elmer counterpose these concepts? What he emphasizes is that we must try to understand the whole of reality, not just parts of it, of ourselves and our existence. 
It's this concentration on wholeness that I find in his work that influences my work on axial ages, which I first heard from Elamer, Carly Esperson, I just could never get him out of my mind, about 20 years ago. Um, and my work on paradigm shift from a mechanistic worldview to an organic worldview. It also influenced um, my work on the dialectics of scientific inquiry in an age of uncertainty, which is a term or a phrase that Elamere used more and more often. So let's look at Elamere's assistant as assessment of quantum mechanics of everyday life, which is available here. In that, uh, um, in that article, he wrote that significant roles that would fill people's lives with purpose and meaning are missing today, and the knowledge gained from the quantum universe is not at all promising, and it makes it even more difficult for people to find their place, roles, and identities in a world that has become increasingly incomprehensible. The loss of traditional fixed points of orientation and growing uncertainty in an infinite, an incomprehensible universe drains intellectual and emotional energies and breaks the continuity and coherence of human communities. He warns that people who feel that their lives are pointless and meaningless are less able to respond to the challenges of the 21st century. This is what Josef was talking about in the opioid crisis in the United States. Well, we have the problem here too. Exploring the possibilities of how a new civilization might emerge and generate um, new meaning and significance for people, he predicts, Elamere predicts, may become one of the primary tasks of the social, human, and natural sciences if they're able and willing to work together and cooperate. Some scientists have made serious efforts to establish links between the quantum universe and humankind, and in some cases, even the meaning of human life. Elamer writes, their attempts have been the first important steps to decode the hidden message a quantum universe may have for humankind. Still, the quantum universe is far from becoming a protective framework within which human beings can feel at home in the world, enjoying relative safety giving meaning to their lives. This is a major social and human problem because when you lose your purpose and meaning, you lose life motivation and whole societies might lose their momentum. There are many economic, social, and cultural causes behind the decreasing ability of Western civilization to create a cosmic home for its citizens. The advance of quantum mechanics is only one of them but nevertheless, it would be a grave mistake not to pay increasing attention to its potential role in this field. The problem is that scholars outside the natural sciences do not really understand what quantum mechanics tells them about the secrets of the universe. The only way to solve this dilemma would be to clo be a close and systematic cooperation between natural and physical scientists, cosmologists, philosophers, theologians, cultural anthropologists, psychologists, social scientists, artists. This is Elamer talking again, you can tell. He loved lists. Um, the final, his final word on this is, closing a smoldering science war, a genuine dialogue should be started in which participants try to understand one another's language and way of thinking. Well, two more slides and I'm done. I argue that with the move of natural sciences towards social sciences via complexity studies and the move of humanities towards the social sciences via cultural studies, we are in the process of overcoming the two cultures of knowledge by recognizing that reality is constructed. And if you are students of Wallerstein, you will know that this is not my original idea. This gradual process of overcoming the artificial distinction between hard and separate disciplines and moving towards the unification of science and human endeavor provides the basis not only for holistic scientific inquiry, but for the basis of new regenerative educational models and multiversities as opposed to universities. 
Instead of science being the enemy of humanities, they both share a common enemy, which is an educational system that avoids addressing the complex and varied global challenges of our age. Real and exacting critical training in any field is essential in order to prepare young people today for the unexpected uncertainties and surprises they will face. And now I will simply give you Elamer's last word. I need to explain this graphic. I searched for an hour for this. If any of you saw his interview at the Woodrow Wilson Institute or any of you took part in, in his presentations here, this was one of his favorite um, graphics. The woman with the upraised arms, what does that symbolize? What does that mean, that graphic? What does it say to you? The woman is separating light from the darkness, okay? And for this, this meant a lot to, to Elamer. I, it means a lot to me that it's a woman doing it. Um, and and uh, you know, that is what he tried to do with his intellectual creativity, was to try to provide light where there was darkness. And so I will give you um, him, his, last, his words as the end of my, my um, contribution. Only such common efforts have any chance of interpreting the quantum cosmos also as a symbolic framework within which human beings can find relative safety and feel their lives have significance and meaning. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>